Yeah, sure. Ah, there you go. Yeah, it's still doing it. Okay. Can you see it on Facebook now? No, I can't actually. Uh, let me see. Not sure why. I know it says it's streaming, but. <laughs> <laughs> it does sometimes take a few minutes to. Um, but there'll be an invitation, eh? It'll just say uh, we are live. Let me just make sure that I've done all the settings correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've made it. I've made it public, so it should be all done. I'm going to share it now as well. Okay. In, in any event, it is recorded, so people can see it as well. But can you see it now and share it? Uh, no, not yet. Hmm. I'll keep checking. Okay, great. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. It's seven o'clock. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Facebook family. Very excited this evening to have um, Kenny Maestri with us, a man who needs no introduction and probably a household name for over 35 years. Welcome, Kenny. Good evening, Nishani. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it was so exciting. Thank you for saying yes. And on behalf of Succeed and my um, partners in, in the organization, Richard Maestri and myself, we'd just like to say we are thrilled that, um, that you're here. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Kenny, we know you as a TV personality, as a household name over radio. Um, but we'd like to really get to know you in this next hour. And... Um, Let's start right at the beginning. Uh, so the date is the 25th of July, 1992. And uh, the song on the radio is Never Give You Up by Sharon Red, yep. played for all your Durban peeps, I'm sure. And, <laughs> the, <laughs> and the station is Capital Radio. And what yeah. is 23-year-old Kenny up to? Well, relative to that weekend, uh, I was at uh, a radio conference for Campus Radio. So it was being hosted by UKZN what was the former Dur University of Durban, uh, Natal yes. Durban at Howard College. So we were busy with that. And uh, obviously my fellow comrades in radio uh, were pretty excited that one of theirs, uh, campus radio jock, was going to be on a commercial station like Capital Radio. Mm. But, you know, it, it all sounds romantic. And, you know, obviously I was encouraged and the guys would have found the wireless and they tuned in and they found it during the show. But it was a very long build up to get to that point where, I was going to be given a slot on capital. So, yes. and, you know, it was like, a, I think a six to eight months period, Darren Scott was handling a show called Give It a, Give it a Go, where they were trying to source uh, young black talent, that being African, Indian and colored from KZN, because they found at capital that the white jocks that they brought over from England, uh, they pay a huge sum of money, offer them a good package. And then only for the SABC through 5FM, would poach them because five was yes. on the FM and of course capital couldn't compete being on medium wave. So they got tired of spending that kind of money and they decided to go local. Also, I think management at the time at capital read the conditions properly. Yeah. Uh, they had attended the Jabulani uh, Radio Freedom Con uh, Conference in Holland uh, a few yeah. years prior to that. So they knew that politically things were changing in the country and liberation yeah. and a democratic government was around the corner. So. In the early 90s, they started looking at recruiting campus radio DJs, black campus radio DJs. So that's how Lee Downs got in and uh, myself, Ravi Naidu, Just Ice. Um, but for us as guys from UDW, we had to wait a long time because even Alan Khan tried out. He got a, yes. you know, he did a give it a go slot, Paul Harper, Lee Downs. And for us, it was a long wait. It actually got to a point where it was actually frustrating. And I think God was preparing me for that in that whatever comes your way, it doesn't always come easily and with a wave of a magical wand. Sometimes, yes, yeah. miracles do happen instantaneously, but 
there's always a process more often than not. And we saw it with the Israelites in, you know, what's it, uh, 300, over 300 years of being in Goshen before they entered the promised land. And we see this talk about yeah. you know, Joshua as well, going from the pit to prison and then Potiphar's house back to prison uh, and then eventually becoming the prime minister of Egypt. So I think mm. that, that was part of the journey that God was using to prepare me for this thing called fame and, and, and fortune. Because I think when you spiritually and emotionally immature, it's not easy for you to be thrust into the public eye. Not that capital was a huge platform, but relatively speaking, compared to campus radio, it was. So yes. it was a frustrating wait. And eventually, uh, I, got, I got in through the back door. And uh, one of my mates from campus radio got in touch with Charlie Rasmus, who now is a producer uh, on the Glen Zito Superdrive on uh, Radio 2000. And Charles and Richard yes. Jones were the guys who actually trained me. I went in, I recorded a show, they called me back again. So I did two recordings in, in the week and nothing because like normally if they record you during the week, they play you on a Saturday morning between five and six. It was just a one hour slot, but that was the platform yeah. they used to source new talent and they didn't play my show. So that, that got even more frustrating. So I thought, okay, maybe they're having second uh, thoughts or doubts about me. And, you know, doubt starts creeping in as well. And then I got a call to come in. I met up with Anthony Duke, who was the program manager at the time, quite a legend in broadcasting. And I have yeah. my career to thank him for because he actually took a chance on me. Um, and he offered me the, the late night slot. Um, and, you know, that, that, that 7 p.m. on a Saturday. And, you know, it's, it's amazing because after such a long wait, and then yeah. there's all these suddenly is happening. I'm, recording a give it a go show it doesn't get played and within two weeks I was on air uh, so yes it, it was exciting because it was such a rapid development getting to that point yeah and also it was a time in our country where um, radio was very segregated I remember Absolutely. we had Radio Truro or and that was it you know yeah. <laughs> so, interesting so, story about Radio Truro uh, they had a competition on air uh, yeah. You know, asking listeners uh, to to give a name for this new station. This was obviously prior to Lotus FM, yeah. and uh, you know, I think prior to Radio Truro, it was Jagadish and the late Jagadish and Deva on uh, I think it was SAFM on a Sunday, uh, playing those sound, uh, South Indian classics. So Radio Truro was a step up, and my mom's friends, my late mom's friend's daughter, uh, yeah. actually gave the name, she won the competition, and that's how Truro got his name. So it's ah. kind of interconnected <laughs> down the road, around the corner from me. Yeah. yeah. And um, I mean, uh, Kenny, you were a big part of Capital Radio and a big part of the destigmatization. So a big part of transforming the face of media um, yeah. through, through those apartheid years. In fact, Look, I, I think yours take, was the- I can't, yeah. I can't take all the credit for it because let's be honest, Capital you know, was multicultural from the, the yeah. get-go. So they had people like uh, Trejan Corsi, Trejan Shabalala, as we know him. Mm. Uh, they had the late, great Oscar Renzi there. Uh, Zayed Kachale was on news. You had Manu Padiachi who became a news yeah. editor, et cetera. So Capital always had people of color uh, on the lineup. Uh, Mish McQuenna as well from Radio Pop. But yeah. I think what you're referring to is the tail end of it and how people of color started, like Lee Downs did the breakfast show and then he left to go to Good F FM. Mm. Uh, Lee is from Newlands East in Durban and, uh, you know, he went there and that's how I ended up on the breakfast show. Um, so yeah, in terms of breaking down those stereotypes, definitely we, we played a role. Yeah. And um, Kenny, you speak very openly about your faith, in fact, uh, even on your social media. And I know that uh, that is a very integral part of who you are. Um, mm -hmm. And through, through the years, I mean, I know the story uh, that your daughter's, uh, Shannon's birth was very instrumental in yeah. you coming to, to know Jesus. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's, look, I mean, you know, we all get like raised Christian or Hindu or Muslim, but we, as children, we don't really understand the implications of our faith and the walk of faith, etc., and knowing our God. Uh, so yes, you go through the motions, you go to Sunday school. I was part of the youth in, in high school mm. and that kind of thing. And then I got to university and of course I got politicized, which meant that I, kind of start embracing things like socialism and uh, referring to myself as being agnostic, you know, believing in a God, but not a religion, which is kind of ironic because that's what Jesus came to do is to do away with religion 
and to establish yeah. relationship with the father. But, you know, I never quite got it back then. And then it's only when I became a father myself and through the difficult pregnancy that Nikki had, and, you know, we had some close calls with premature mm -hmm. birth. And in fact, Shannon was 35 weeks uh, in the womb and, and she had to be taken out because Nikki's amniotic fluid started drying up and she got too big for the womb. So, you know, an emergency C-section had to happen. And that started the journey in terms of getting to know who God really is and, you know, establishing a relationship with him as well. So I think my, my first daughter's birth was the, the trigger uh, that launched me into this path of yeah. wanting to know Jesus better and wanting to know the Father and Holy Spirit as well. And uh, yeah, look, now it's a more personal relationship rather than I'm just doing this because it's a religion. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, uh, have you found that you are able to use the, the platform given to you on radio and TV or in the public space to, um, I don't know, to share your faith or to establish God's love in the world? Yeah, look, you know, it's, it's how you do it because at the end of the oh. day, if you're working on a commercial platform, uh, they would like to remain yeah. neutral as if you can. I, I don't think you can. Um, you know, you, you offer your opinions as broadcasters and people either like what you say or they don't like it. And, you know, I realize that there's no way that I'm going to make friends with everybody given my views because not even Jesus could win over all of the Jews uh, mm. when he came right. as the Messiah and the Lamb of God. So one has to be realistic about that as well. So, yes, I don't push, you know, Jesus every uh, in every link of mine, but you get an overall sense of who I am and, and the kind of man that I am and who's behind me and who I am aspiring to be. And yes, you might hear me say, you know, like I had a five-year-old call to say last weekend that his mom was sick and I played the voice yes. note and I said, I pray that she be healed and made whole. So if you're a Christian, you know that I'm referring to, you know, by his stripes, we have been made, yeah. we have been healed and made whole. So I'm not in your face and I, I don't like to be because it's not about showboating, yeah. uh, you know, to people that this is your faith. But if you have a personal relationship with Jesus, you can't help but like, you know, share the good news, share the gospel. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> that is true. That is true. But, you know, can you speak about your experiences and having go gone through the process? And I know, um, you know, follow having followed your, your, your career over the years, that it hasn't always been easy and it hasn't always been glamorous. Yeah. Um, you've taken buses, you've sat on, <laughs> you've slept on friends' couches, you know, um, and, and I know for a fact that, you know, you also went through a very difficult time when Shannon was, was coming into this world with Metro FM. Yes. Uh, and that was sort of the, the, big, uh, the big story of your life, I guess, but, but, it, but it is in the past. Um, and you went through quite a negative experience of bullying, of being harassed, of, of being, you know, sort of kicked out, if I want to say it, quite frankly. Look, I was treated like a pariah. Um, you know, I was isolated, uh, you know, amongst colleagues, you know, especially when management came into a room, colleagues would move yeah. away from me, uh, switch from speaking English to a vernacular language. Um, so I was isolated physically and through language and communication. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I, I really, I don't have time to, to, I'm too lazy to bear grudges, to be honest. <laughs> You know, to remember who did what to you, when and how and why, yeah. it'll make you just a very angry or very bitter and depressed person. And I think that's part of the growth process. Because, yes, there was a time where when I was moved to weekends and lost 80% of my income, I, I, was a, I was angry and I was bitter and I, I ended up in depression uh, for at least 10 years of my life. Which, okay. you know, when it was wasted, but not necessarily because when I look back and if you with the prophetic anointing more often than not you're more sensitive in your spirit so a person like isaiah uh, not isaiah elijah elijah yes mm. he was the one who took on jezebel and those priests and yeah. he suffered depression so did david yeah. so did moses yeah. so you know these are very when you mature in the faith and when you mature in the word you begin to realize that hey these people weren't perfect you know and yeah. even jesus had his moments yes he didn't sin in his flesh but there was a time when he turned those tables up because they were turning his father's house into a place of money uh, exchanges and money lenders yeah. and that kind of thing. So emotions are part of who we are as human beings. And yes. I've just gotten to a point where I realized that I need to forgive, not so for that person's benefit, whoever did me harm or wrong, 
uh, throughout my life, but rather for my own peace and my own sanity, because it's like drinking poison and hoping the other person would die. I mean, that's just stupid. So yeah. you come to that realization and, you know, you forgive. Have I learned lessons from all of that? Absolutely. Yes. You know, I can't blame uh, everything that happened to me on whoever made the decision to move me to weekends. I, I feel that I had a role to play in it as well, because, you know, there's a fine line between being confident in what you do and becoming arrogant. And quite often mm -hmm. it's easy to blur those lines if you're not centered. And at the time I wasn't centered in Christ. I was pretty much in my flesh. You know, I didn't spend much time with the Lord be it reading his word, attending church or in prayer. And it's only after I got married, my wife and I make a, at the time make a commitment to, to attend church because we were going to be raising children and yeah. we wanted to raise them in the ways of the Lord. So it's been a journey for me. And that's why when I look back on all of these things, I'm not angry or bitter. Uh, yes, it was tough. But I think in that process, yeah. the seeds of greatness that the Lord planted in me were allowed to germinate uh, and, and produce fruit that I'm now beginning to see the benefits of. Uh, but at the time, man, it was, it was tough. I, I wanted to cry. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe you had to give up a Z3 as well. <laughs> yeah, that was my baby, Foxy Roxy. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, even there, you know, material things come and go. And Paul said it best when he said, you know, he's learned to live through good times, through lean times. And in all these times, he gives praise to the Lord because it's his grace that sees us through. Now, quite often, especially believers, um, who believe in this like instantaneous gratification and miracles being performed. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, but I'm saying, you know, if you live with that kind of thinking, then you, you're missing the boat because even the disciples who spend time with Jesus, who broke bread with him, yeah. some of them had to go through a journey of growth. And more of the, most of them actually did that growth after he ascended into heaven. So growth is part of your journey as a believer. And it's those tough times that actually brings out the greatness in you. And mm. it's been in you all this time, but it's only through those challenges in life that you really begin to understand what God has put in you. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you speak so uh, so openly about this. So thank you. Thank you for speaking openly about depression. I think men especially yeah. um, struggle, struggle to get treatment and struggle to say, hey, you know, I'm suffering from depression or seeing a psychiatrist. And mental illness is very real in our society. Look, uh, you know what? At the time, I didn't even know I was depressed. I thought I was just sad because I lost 80% of my income. I had to give up my, you know, my car and other material possessions. So at the time, you know, and of course, coming from an Indian community, I think, you know, generally speaking, uh, like African Americans would say, we don't go to psychologists, we don't go to therapy, mm. you know, and in our cultures, it, we didn't need that because we had the extended family model. So you always had your grandparents with you. You had your uncles and aunts and, you know, your, your grandparents, sibling around you. You lived in these communities. So when it came to sharing how you felt or, you know, trying to get wisdom and knowledge and understanding, you could always turn to your elders. Unfortunately, yeah. with modern society, that has created, you know, with people sort of changing their worldview, changing how they approach life and socializing. Uh, people are more reliant on psychologists versus elders with wisdom and i think for me yes it's nice to have the academic side to it but it's also important to have that support network of family and and close friends who can see you through difficulties because they've lived it um and i think that's lacking in modern society mm. that's so true that is so true and there's this power in storytelling you know when you tell Absolutely. your story when you tell your story it begins to lose power over you you know um, but Kenny, you know, it didn't end there. And you speak about 2017 as being the year that everything, <laughs> everything in your life personally just uh, came crashing. You know, here you are serving God and, and doing your thing. But 2017 was for you a year that just, you know, you, you kind of nothing worked. Um, yeah, look tell us a little bit about that. But most especially tell us about some of the nuggets that you took out of that year. Is, so a bit of background if somebody's watching yeah. for the first time. Um, look, yes. I've dealt with depression throughout most of my life, you know, and it's always been something that I've had to deal with. Um, like I said, when you're in the prophetic anointing, uh, the enemy comes against you hard. And one of the ways he tries to trap you is through depression. So, you know, I've been through this journey and we, my wife and I at the time went to through Bible college. This was after Metro FM got rid of me. Uh, from the breakfast show on in 2011 
even though I tripled the listenership within two years by the grace of God. Um, and that could have started a cycle of depression, but you know, it was the time where God was showing me grace. And I, I wanted to know more about grace because you know, people at the time thought Joseph Prince was crazy. What's this grace thing? You know, is it a license to sin, etc.? So I got curious to find out more about this grace. And you know, the revelation I got out of it was that it's actually the gospel, the good news. Grace is personified in the person of Jesus Christ. We don't deserve Jesus. We haven't earned his favor, but he went to the cross for us. He became a curse so that we could become a blessing. If that's not grace personified, then I don't know what is. So I started that journey in that, that whole uh, period of 21 months when I didn't work. And, you know, my wife and I got very close in that period. We ran a home cell, miracles and prophetic word was coming th through me yeah. in the home cell. So things were really on fire. And then, you know, building up to 2017, for about two or three years, you know, we, we had a communication breakdown in marriage. You know, when, when you're arguing, you're arguing because you're not getting through to each other. Uh, emotions take over, your flesh takes over. So even if you are mature in the spirit, this can happen to you and it happened to yeah. us. And, you know, 2017 started off with us having a scare with my dad. Um, you know, he was sick. Um, he, he went into the hospital, they did a test. And in February, we got the confirmation that he had stage four prostate cancer. Oh, so that was quite a shock. And on that yeah. very day was, you know, we had one of our fights and that's when my wife said she wanted a divorce. Um, not that a couple doesn't talk about divorce throughout their marriage. I mean, it happens when you fight, but you know, that was quite serious. And mm -hmm. a month later she moved out. Um, in that year, we lost my dad on my daughter's 15th birthday. Um, mm -hmm. Lost a dog as well, lost a job. So like everything mm -hmm. that the devil could throw me, you know, happened, uh, throw at me. So the nuggets I got out of it is that life continues even with loss. Even when you lose a parent, your life continues. And I think my dad's passing in 2017, and this year my mom passed away during COVID uh, yes. in July. And the thing I got out of their deaths was that they have planted seeds in us and their hard work and the foundational work that they've done, we stand on their shoulders and we continue with our legacy given what they've put in us. So part of their legacy is lived through us and part of our legacy will be lived through our children and so on. And so the cycle of, and the circle of life continues. So I've learned that death and separation doesn't mean the end of things. It just means a continuation with the next generation. So my father's passing in 2017 opened the door for me to step up. Not that I wasn't a man, but you know, with your parents dying, you man up, you become the adult and you start taking the role model uh, scenario more seriously with your children and grandchildren. So that was one of the things. The other thing is that no matter what came my way, and I mean, I didn't ask the question, can it get any worse? Because I've been through that cycle before. And when you ask the devil if there's anything worse, then he'll show you. So I learned that lesson. I wasn't about to invite him to cause more uh, mayhem and havoc in my life. Not that he wasn't trying, but yeah, I just, the more it happened, it's amazing. Because I just said, Lord, not by might or by power or my flesh, but by your spirit, I will overcome this. And by your grace, I will overcome. And I received it through faith. And yeah. it's amazing because the worst things got throughout that year, uh, the more peaceful I became, the calmer I became. And my friends and family around me were like, what is up with you? Because you should be drinking or thinking about suicide or something. You should be doing something in your flesh because this is just too much to deal with. And I'm like, but I got Jesus. So what more do I need? <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a piece that transcends understanding mm. i guess yeah you know yeah. yeah yeah and some people call it the the eye of the storm yeah look i mean Perhaps. you know when when the disciples were on the boat with jesus when they're crossing galilee you know he was asleep he was calm they were frantic they were yeah. lord have you forgotten about us don't you care about us and the example he was leading was that you know what god is with you whether you're in the storm, whether you're in the palace, or whether you, you know, world famous celebrity, whatever the case may be, in your highs and in your lows, the Lord never leaves you nor forsakes you. And that's what I learned in 2017, is that the Lord did not abandon me. Um, and for me, that was what I needed 
uh, most. And I mean, I went into a period of separation and isolation because I only got divorced in January 2018. Yeah. Sadly, this the divorce rate is so high in South Africa, we couldn't get a, a court date before okay. Christmas. So, you know, and then once the divorce happened, that's when it knocks you hard because my daughters were staying with my ex-wife at the time. And I basically lived on my own. I would see them obviously every second weekend, but just that separation and in Indian culture, you know, your family and your children are everything. So yes, it was hard, but I had to go through the process of isolation, not socializing much and do a bit of self-reflection and do a bit of spiritual growth as well. Get closer to God because when you're in a conflict situation, you focus so much on what's not working in the relationship, you actually put God in the back burner. So it was a yeah. chance for me to do a course correction. And in that introspection and isolation, as much as it was, as it was tough and I was slipping into depression again, um, I, got, I got through it and God was with me every day. And it's amazing because since then, you know, I've turned the corner now. I'm still single. I'm not looking for a relationship at the moment because my one, Shannon, is in the trick and Jordan is in grade 10. So I need to focus on them. But I mean, look, if he does send me my Proverbs 31 wife who's beautiful on the inside <laughs> and out, I ain't say no. Is that a commercial? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, <it's not. laughs> but I mean, obviously, I desire that in a, in a future wife, obviously, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the ad. That's a free ad for you. <laughs> to all the, the Facebook family watching, did you hear? No, no, don't miss, don't, yeah. don't miss the line, guys. <laughs> So Kenny, you know, you've come a long way and, and, and you're kind of a gray fox now. So um, what advice, when you look back at your life and you've grown so much and, and you've lived so much life and so many different experiences, if you could give your 23 year old self standing there in the, I think it's Oddwax studio, right? Is it the Oddwax yeah. or what was it? Oddwax. Oddwax at Uni, Campus Radio. Oddwax, yes, on Campus Radio. And so that, that would be my 18 year old self, actually. That was back it was your 18 year old years. self. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, you were 18 years old. You were on this radio station. You were a psychology student, right? Yeah. Psychology well, student. student. Did you? Yeah, look, uh, initially I was doing a BSc because, you know, back then you know, um, in the Indian community, you targeted being a doctor, lawyer, or a teacher. Yeah. And my, my, my grades in matric wasn't that great. I just started rebelling. And, you know, I just, after, I think, 11 uh, and a half years of studying, I just got mm. tired. And I actually self-sabotaged when I, when I look at it now, because I told my dad I wanted to be a doctor because he was really pushing me for medicine. I was a good student, especially in primary school. High school, I didn't shine that much, but I did become head boy, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and so I did it more for my dad and my mom rather than who I wanted to be. And, yeah. you know, I think, I know I self-sabotage. So my grades weren't that good. I just got one distinction and I think I had a C pass overall. So that yeah. meant I couldn't get into medicine. So the next option was to do pharmacy, but my grades weren't good enough for that. So I did a BSc with chemistry and biochemistry as majors. I got biochemistry and then with chemistry, I went up to chemistry two, failed chemistry three. And then by that time, I had run out of time to finish my degree. So I had eight out of nine credits. But when yeah. I started at Capital, I, I, I basically got in, switched majors through UNISA and completed psychology. So you ask, how does psychology fit in, in, in being a broadcaster? Absolutely. You know, communication, understanding people, human behavior, yeah. it makes you a better communicator and, and, you know, obviously a better broadcaster manifesting in that form as a radio presenter or host. I mean, it can help you with talk uh, TV and radio as well. And that's yeah. something I'm pursuing. Uh, a talk show on television. We hope, God willing, it'll manifest soon, um, or at least yeah. in the early part of next year. So yes, the, the the degree helps you not only in terms of in terms of the major I did. Fine, you know, it, it has a direct impact. But I think if you're studying, um, it just takes you to another level of understanding. It opens yeah. your eyes to a worldview, a multicultural society. Coming from apartheid, where everything was so segregated, going to university broadened my vision, and that's when I saw black people as human beings rather than less than, because that's what we were told uh, during the apartheid regime. And, you know, white people were elevated to a godlike status. And then you get to university and everyone's on the same footing. We're all struggling yes. with studying, passing all exams and stuff like that. And that's when you start relating to people from different colors and cultures. 
on an equal footing and you, you get to know people um, and engage with them as human beings rather than as us, us and them, you know. Uh, so university experience at, or tertiary level education is important in terms of understanding people and how to build a society. Um, and, and the advice that you would give your 18 year old self if you had to see him standing in that um, campus radio, <laughs> radio station um, now, what would you, would you say, don't do it? <laughs> No, not at all. I would say go for it, but check your ego. I think egos, checking your ego is very important because let's face it, when we are young and I see it, you know, with my children being in high school, that whole know it all thing, I think for them it's worse because they've got Google and access to information. So yeah. suddenly, you know, young, young people always think that they know better than older people. But the fact is you haven't lived life, not to the extent that your parents and grandparents have. So there's always that experiential learning that you can tap into if you are humble enough and remain teachable. And the Bible says we should remain teachable. And I don't think not, not just as teenagers, but throughout life, remain yeah. teachable because you don't know everything. And nobody can claim to know everything except God. So yes, I was a bit rebellious uh, as a teenager, thought I knew it all, overconfident. And that's why I said, you know, when I got to Metro FM, uh, people, you know, I, I may have seen me as being arrogant. Um, and maybe th there were times when that line got blurred. So I would say to my younger self, check your ego, remain focused, remain humble, uh, remain teachable, um, and you know, embrace life, enjoy life. One thing I would tell my younger self is savor moments because we are to live in the present. I mean, Matthew 6.33, you can't worry about tomorrow and what's going to happen tomorrow. You can't worry about the past. Sufficient for the day God will provide, you know, and he did yeah. so for the Israelites with the manna from heaven. And so we, we must rely on God on a daily basis. And it's important to be in the moment. And you realize this, that especially when you're an adult and when you have children, uh, if you're too much in a hurry for them to start walking, start talking, you know, and you want them to be like independent, et cetera, you miss out on those baby stages where they are totally dependent on you. And yes, you know, being woken up three, four times at night to change diapers can be a challenge. And we've been through that. But now that my daughters are older and, you know, they're teenagers, I miss, you know, carrying them in my arms or I regret yeah. not playing more with them. So I'm saying to my younger self, save a moments, enjoy them. Yeah, so save a moments, check your ego. And I mean, that's like, that's sort of, sort of advice for every day, even now. Absolutely. You know? Even now. And, you know, with all your experiences, where do you think God is leading you? In which direction do you think he's leading you now? I know you spoke um, speaking about a, a, a talk show, but what else is what else is Kenny up to? No, for me right now, it's about being a dad. You know, mm -hmm. thank God my daughters now live with me. They live with their mom for two and a half years now. They live with me. I've been, been living with me for a year now, and I'm grateful for the opportunity that they've given me to 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 repair the damage. Because when a couple fights and argues almost on a daily basis, you know, yeah. pre-divorce that toxicity seeps into the children. And quite often they end up being the punching bags because you know parents get frustrated with each other because they're yeah. not getting through with each other. And you end up taking, off, uh, taking a lot of that frustration out on your children. So the, yes, there was damage done on my part and you know, I'm willing to step up and own my part in that whole journey or what happened in that episode, that, yeah. that period of my life. And my daughters have now given me the opportunity to, to be a dad to them. And, and to get it right. I don't get it right every day, we're human, but at the same time, it's an opportunity for me to spend time with them before they become adults and independent. So yeah. I'm just grateful and thankful for that opportunity. So that's my main focus really, is to be a father, to sow into their lives and, and, and make sure that I'm raising strong women of God who are rooted in the word of God and in their faith. So that's the main focus for now. In terms of my career, Look, it, it might seem like I'm at the end of my career, given my age and, you know, doing weekend shows on 702, but God is the God of the impossible. Because when I turned 40 and I was working yeah. on 947, going nowhere slowly because I was doing a mid-morning slot, there was no opportunities for me to do primetime radio. And it was kind of like a slow death playing high rotation songs, you know, like almost every day, the same music. Yeah. And I'd go to sleep and the lyrics would be playing in my head. And I turned 40, and nine days after I turned 40, on the 25th of February, um, 2009, uh, if you prophetic, you'll understand why I'm mentioning numbers here. Yeah, because nine. the numeric, yeah. 
here, you know, um, nine days after I turned 40, 40, representing a period of trial and testing. So prophetically, that it, it all lined up, you know, and it was nine years after Metro let me go that I actually went back uh, to do the breakfast show. And I, I'd been declaring that I'm the head and not the tail. And, you know, it's amazing how that whole thing panned out because initially I was supposed to do the afternoon drive. And yeah. then two weeks before I could start with the breakfast show, I got promoted and I got an increase. Okay. <laughs> and it was double what I was earning at uh, 947. Or 947. I felt as it was known at the time. So, you know, it's incredible how uh, God was able to turn things around. So, yes, I may, it may appear that I'm 51, I'm doing weekend radio, it's the end of his career, but you never know. God could put me back in a primetime radio slot, back on a breakfast show on a national radio platform. Uh, or he could give me a, a talk show on TV or do something that's global. So I am open. I am willing to receive. I'm like, Lord, surprise me. Because I know yeah. you're good. At <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to limit God with my imagination. I'm open to whatever he wants me to do. And yes, I am writing a book. I, well, I haven't written in a while. But I'm writing a book about my life and how God's hand has been uh, on my life. And how he's like been there for me throughout this entire journey. Wow. And when can we expect the book? Yeah. <laughs> Next year, July. Let's, 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 let's make it the day you went on to radio for the first time. I was hoping. I was hoping that, you know, initially it was supposed to be when it was like, I think, what, 25 years in radio. It didn't happen yeah. then. Uh, I was hoping it would be this year, but obviously, 20, you know, COVID happened and all of that. But God willing, by the 25th of July, 2021, uh, it should be out, if not sooner. But uh, let's see how it goes. Okay, great. So, Kenny, you speak very fondly of your daughters and you speak of your mom. And, you know, you, you often say your mom was very instrumental in getting you into radio because that's where yeah. your love for music and, and maybe her straightforwardness came out um, in your life. And, and you carry that legacy. Um, yeah. If there's one thing you'd like to see changed in this world for women, what would it be? Look, my mother was a disruptor. And, you know, she was a city slicker. She married this farm boy. Uh, she was from Marisburg. My dad lived uh, half an hour outside of Marisburg in a place called Kule in Dalton, which is near yeah. New Hanover, Great Town. And that's sugarcane country and a lot of Germans settled over there. Um, mm. So she had a tough upbringing where she was treated like the maid in the family. Um, her da dad went back to India. Her, those siblings that were close to her went to other cities. So it was very lonely for her in that environment, in, in a hostile environment, actually. And yeah. when she met my dad and when they got married, it was an arranged marriage. So it wasn't a marriage out of, mm. you know, we fall in love and all of that. It was, it was, yeah. it was hard work. And then you're marrying in, as a Hindu, you're marrying into a Christian family, but they're not showing you the love of Jesus. They are just doing what your siblings did to you. They are treating you like a maid. And the yeah. conventional thing at the time was, Indian mother-in-laws treated their daughter-in-laws like mates. Yeah. And, you know, the brother-in-laws who weren't married, the younger brother-in-laws would just jump on the bandwagon, etc. So my mother had a lot to deal with. And my father wasn't very supportive at the time because that was the culture they were raised in. The women were servants and slaves as opposed to life partners. And, you know, for me, a wife is very important because a man is a doer and he makes decisions. Yes. But it's actually the woman who gives life and birth. She's an incubator of ideas and things and seeds, not just physical mm. seeds as the children, but also ideas. So a man may have a vision of, say, starting a business, but he needs to talk to his wife. And if she's a Proverbs 31 kind of wife, she will pray about it. She will meditate on it. And then it's amazing how she will flesh this whole thing out. So, you know, whether it's a business or like, say, building a house, a man will go and acquire the land. You might say, I want a double story. But how are you going to decorate it? How are you going to fill the space? The color scheme, the type of fixtures, etc. That's what women are good, of, good at. And that's how they were, are wired. And that's how God created them. So it's important for a man to respect his wife as a life partner. And really, somebody who's there, um, his helpmate. And so for me, it's like, in order for things to change in society, men need to realize that women are not sex objects, as we see mm. with GDP in South Africa. Um, they're certainly not your servants. They're not slaves. 
They yeah. have an integral part to play in building a society. I think they are the glue that holds the family together. Um, and if you look at it in the prophetic, women are more sensitive to the Holy Spirit than men are. Men are thick. We stupid sometimes. You know, <laughs> once we get an idea, you, you said know, it. We, oh, you gosh, said it. <laughs> um, and we, I mean, I had an idea of opening up a nightclub to 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 make up for my income. And my, my wife at the time said to me, "No, don't do this. I don't feel good. It doesn't sit well with me." At that stage, we weren't mature enough to discern that it was actually the Holy Spirit speaking to her. So yes, a man may be even a pro operating in a prophetic anointing, but his wife is always more sensitive than he is to the Holy Spirit. Very few may, men are able to be on that level because we're just not wired that way. So rely on your wife to be that support and that source of wisdom and your, 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 your more intimate connection to the Holy Spirit because women are just wired differently from men. But remember, both in a female and male, the spirit of man was given to that body. Yeah. So we are of the same spirit. And I think that's where people get it confused where it's, let's make man in our image. God was referring to man as in the spirit of man because God is spirit. And if we are yeah. being created in the image of God, it's not the physical suit that you have and I have as a female and a male. It's the spirit of man that is in the image of God. So, and if you look at it, I mean, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's our spirit man that's reborn. It's not our, our physical bodies that get reborn. We can't re-enter the womb. So yeah. when you understand things from that perspective, I think it just makes the whole male-female relationship a lot easier to understand. Yeah. And with so much of GBV and so much of, you know, it's become almost cliche. Although, mm -hmm. I mean, sadly, Johannesburg is the rape capital of the world. Um, raising two daughters in the city. Yeah, and you're raising two daughters in the city. So, I mean, what is your what is your message to men? Because you know we focus on the women, we focus on like you know helping women to get it right, and we talk about that. But we're not focusing on the 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 root cause of the issue, which is badly behaved men. Well, I think it's more than just badly behaved men. Um, you know, the point is that GBV is not a woman problem; it's a man problem. Yeah, so let's start with I that. Have to agree. Let's acknowledge where we as men have failed. Um, because when we do that, we can start the conversation, the honest conversation, not this, uh, you know, just saying things for scoring political points and using hashtags yeah. and trying to appear woke. I don't want to be woke. I want to be proactive. I want to be living the word of God, even in that situation. Because yeah. my Bible tells me that through, through Christ, we, we are new creatures, a new creation, and we have his spirit in us. And therefore, in the New Testament, uh, and, you know, it's sad that even in churches we have to address this issue, um, there is no male or female, yeah, no Jew or Gentile, mm. and no slave or free man. Or, yeah. or, you know, so awesome. it's addressing sexism and GBV being part of that. It's addressing racism. It's also addressing classism. Yeah. And... You know, so we are all one body, and that's always been God's uh, intention for us to live in peace and harmony with each other, not oppressing uh, anyone because they are different from us, uh, yeah. be it in terms of sex, sexual orientation, faith, uh, social status, or culture. And I think if we get more real about our conversations and we address it from that perspective, we can definitely make progress as a society. Obviously, we live in a multicultural, multi faith society, but there's enough whether it's the Bhagavad Gita or the Quran or any even African spiritualism, there's enough in common that we have as humanity to say, this is wrong. And the Bible says this, you know, mm. the sense of right and wrong is in, being placed in every human being. Yeah. So we know right and we know wrong. And men, we know what's happening to our women is absolutely wrong. It's a, yeah. not just violation, it's murder, plain and yeah. simple murder. So, yeah. you know, we need to stop and stop it now. And even if you're not a rapist, and I'm certainly not a rapist, but you know, men are doing this and we need to address men on the issue um, as men. And yeah. I know it's quite, quite often people say, oh, but if women dress more modestly, man, uh, what happens to the, 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 the infant that was lying in a cot that gets yeah. raped? What was that baby doing? You know, oh, that woman just... wearing a full attire. Uh, yeah. What was she doing to provoke that? It's, the problem is with the guy. He can't control his urges. Um, and for me, it goes back to your relationship with the Lord because, you know, self-control is one of the uh, fruits of the Holy Spirit. Fruits of the Spirit. 
Yeah, so. bit of a spirit. Yeah, and you know, last year in um, last year I spent two weeks in the uh, Eastern Cape, in a very rural Eastern Cape, in an immersion project, and I worked and I lived among people there. And one of the things that I found was that girls didn't have access to sanitary wear, which is such a basic need, you know. And the, the shops were probably about oh, half a day's walk. So even to go to the shop, I would need to drive about an hour, an hour and a half. And um, as desperate as you, was, you were, you know, you kind of had to make the choice. Do I need this chocolate or don't I need this chocolate? But what I found was that the girls didn't have sanitary wear. That meant that most of them were not going to school during that one week when they were menstruating. And yeah. that, that affected the absenteeism rate by 75%. Sheesh. Not only that, Kenny, but what happened was the girl that was staying at home was unguarded. So she became very vulnerable in that, in that space, especially in rural South Africa. And, you know, if she had the money and if she could get to the shop, then she had the choice. Do I buy a packet of mealy meal or bread or do I buy a packet of sanitary towels? And yeah. for me and for us to succeed, you know, that's a very violent choice. No woman should have to make that choice. Not in 2020, mm. you know? It, it, what, what really, you know, frustrates me, and yeah. I do get angry about this, I mean, I'm human. How is it that a progressive government and a progressive movement, a uh, liberation movement like the ANC, as an example, uh, can provide condoms? Yeah, I always say, yeah. But not sanitary pads for school-going uh, girl children. No. So, for me, I, you know, we really have our priorities all mixed up here, and you know, in this is this is the irony of it all. Because if you look in traditional African society, the women do the work, they they labor, they they they, they plant yeah. the crops. The men were were warriors, you know, and yeah. hunters, gatherers, hunters rather. So your society was stabilized because of how women contributed to a culture and a community. Yeah. And in the, even in the Indian community, it's the same thing. The mother is the one who makes that house tick and operate. I mean, she's in charge of that kitchen. She knows how to provide for her family. I mean, my granny had 12 sons and two daughters, and she knew exactly how to dish out for each child. Yeah, you know, it's amazing how they did that. Pivotal. Yes, yeah. women are yeah. pivotal in terms of building a, a prosperous and a successful society. Yeah. And, you know, if we abandon young women, uh, especially in our rural areas and poverty-stricken areas, uh, we are actually creating a recipe for an implosion of our society. And we are also contributing to a dysfunctional society. I mean, like you said, these girls can't go to school because they don't have sanitary pads. They yes. stay at home and then you, you're, you're open to becoming a victim of rape. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. Because now everyone's away and there's that one uncle who's, or neighbor who's around and he's not working, he's drunk or whatever where he can't control himself and there's this beautiful teenage girl and she yeah. gets raped and she gets physically abused or even killed. So we, I think, we, yes, we can blame government for not having their priorities straight, but I think we as a society, uh, whether it's business or communities, will have more. I think it's about sharing resources yeah. and, and even empowering young ladies in terms of education. Mm. Um, so, I think we yeah. need to share information and resources. Yeah. And so what we do at Succeed is, you know, and the part of Seeds of Hope is that we provide a sanitary pack for girls. And this pack lasts the girl up to five years. So it keep, okay. can keep her going for up to five years. It's reusable, completely green, 100 percent, you know, organic, all good to the earth, um, that type of uh, that type of uh, level. And yeah. what we're doing is we're asking you if you want to partner with us and please let us know. Um, please go and like our Succeed page or just drop us an, uh, um, a message if you want to be part of this project. Because, you know, as much as every, every one of us can make a difference, let's just put it like that. And we yes. want to plant seeds of hope. We want to give girls an equal footing um, and safety as well in, in society. Yeah. So if we want to contribute, do, do you like have a monthly contribution commitment or a pledge? Yes, we have, we have a monthly uh, contribution, which is a pledge, or you can give a once-off donation, okay. um, and then, then we get the, the sanitary towels out to the girls. We, we had last week uh, a pack, uh, some packs go out to the girls in Cosmos City, uh, okay. which is just, on, just a, a neighboring 
uh, space near us, but we had such a dire need that we had to send out um, yeah, some, some sanitary towels there. Okay, so your uh, Facebook page is Seeds of Hope. It's uh, Succeed. Succeed. S-U-C-S-E-E-D. -E okay. All yeah, because right. we have many projects, Kenny, but this is one of our key key projects that we run. Yeah. Cool, man. I definitely will jump on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. And you know, um, as we come to a close, I, I want to ask you, what is your seed of hope that you would like to leave South Africans globally? We are, we're in the middle of a pandemic and, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to hold on to hope. Things are difficult. People are losing loved ones, losing jobs. Um, what is your message of hope, Kenny? Um, without hope, how do we exist? You know, and, and Jesus came to give us hope and the hope of eternal life and being part of God's family through his blood. And what I went through in 2017 or throughout my life, it's what I write about in my book. It's how God's hand and how that gave me hope in my life. And so I would say, you know, have a relationship with Jesus. Uh, for me personally, that's what I would do. And if you're of another faith, I mean, you know, you still, hope doesn't just reside with Christians. Anybody, you know, can have yeah. hope. Um, and without hope, you cannot progress in life. Uh, because hope is something that motivates you, drives you. And you yeah. can fight off depression, you can fight off poverty. When you have hope, when you have a reason to get up in the morning, when you have a reason to build something and to work together with other communities and other people, because there's a there's a dream, there's a vision, and, and you've caught that vision. And yeah. that's what we hope fuels that vision and the manifestation of the vision happens. And I mean, let's be honest. I mean, we lived in a society that looked like it was, you know, heading towards civil war because uh, the apartheid mach machine amped up during the 80s with the states of emergency, yeah. the anti-apartheid lobbies, etc. And it was, you know, it was going head to head. And suddenly things just turned around and political leaders were released, political organizations were unbanned. And before we knew it, we were sitting with a democratic government elected in 1994. So we've yeah. seen that example in our own country's history. And right now there are some political leaders who are pushing for ethnic violence and prejudice and, and, and you know, certain communities are being targeted. And yes, I can understand the frustration of people because the government of the day hasn't delivered on its promises as yeah. a liberation movement. So yes, they've, they've done it dirty on the people. and. So there is frustration in this country, but I also believe there's hope in this country. And, you know, last night I was at a gig in Cusino and it was an Indian family that was celebrating the wife's 50th birthday. Mm, um, I saw that. They, yeah. Yes, and they had guests, you know, white guests, black people were there, uh, colored people. So it was a, a rainbow nation, predominantly Indian crowd, but a rainbow nation crowd nevertheless. And, you know, I was playing music and eventually I started playing local music and guess what? The dance floor erupted. and I just saw people enjoying. I even played one or two Bangra songs. Mm -hmm. And just to see people get together through music and how music brought people together. And if you look at our struggle, music has always been part of our society. Yeah. And it's in African culture. People sing when there's a birth of a child. They sing when yes. there's a wedding. They also sing when there's a funeral. And they celebrate the life of the person who died through music, yeah. song, and dance. So I would say there is lots of hope in this country. And South Africans have an amazing spirit. Uh, of hard work, we tenacious, and we're able to achieve, even though our history may not have been the best in the world, but we've come through it all. And I do believe that we have the potential to be an amazing rainbow nation, a, ra a nation of hope. And that that's is what so the is. Yeah, and, and I must say, Kenny, having listened to you on radio, you know, in this world that's so full of, uh, of content and information, I always think, you know, uh, you can you can deliver your music and you can play your music but somehow you, and maybe it's old school maybe it's the teaching of the you know legends that that go before you but mm -hmm. you've been able to help people feel your music and how yeah. how do you do that how do you do that because it, it it speaks about human connection then yeah so let's start off by saying that my radio has never been about color so that's how as an indian guy i ended up doing the breakfast show on a predominantly white station like capital and then later on, I joined Metro FM, which is predominantly Black African. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've worked on 947, which was predominantly an Afrikaans listenership initially. Yeah. And Heifold was owned by the SABC. So I've been a disruptor in my own right. And, you know, I've gone against conventional thinking and I've broken down stereotypes. In fact, it all started on campus radio because Ordwek was predominantly Indian and they, 
they kind of cloned the capital radio approach so a lot of rock music was being played so the likes of Sanka Mota, Mota and Stimela and others other South African artists weren't getting that airtime and then guys like myself joined the radio station and that's when the transformation happened so I would say you you need to challenge uh, what is in existence especially when there's a bigger vision and a bigger dream and through it, you understand the emotional connection people have with music. And that's how, if you sell it to, to your listener and you're able to step, reinforce that emotional connection. So as an example, on my Sunday show yeah. uh, on 702 Soulful Sundays, when I play a Teddy Pendergrass song, a classic from him or the OJs, more often than not, you'll get a cross section of listeners. I probably do one of the most crossover radio shows in South Africa at the moment. And when you listen to the voice notes, you'll know what I'm saying. And people yeah. from all colors and cultures will say, I, I know this song or I love this song because my dad used to listen to it, mm. put the LP on and the stylus onto the, the vinyl. Or my uncle used to listen to it and we used to gather around on the stoop, yeah. you know, in the backyard and that kind of thing. So it triggers those memories. And I mean, even the time tunnel on a Saturday, it's about the memories and the music. And what were you doing when you heard the song? Were you making love to your wife when you heard the song uh, for the first time? Or did you buy your new car? Uh, and you turn on the radio and the song is playing on the radio, uh, or maybe it reminds you of your matric dance. So yeah. when you are able to relate those stories and people relate their stories to you, that's how you build a loyal listenership in radio. So it's not really about your ego. Uh, it's about the kind of music you play and the emotional connection it has with your listeners. And, you know, radio is a form of escapism. Music is, it helps you get through those difficult times. It certainly helped me in my life. Yeah, yeah. And always it comes back to the fact and the power of storytelling. Yeah. You know, and, and associating it to stories. Which yeah, is because really, I mean, radio, yeah. radio is defined theater of the mind. And the more colorful you're able to uh, express your thoughts uh, through language on a platform like radio, it's amazing because each person listening to you will hear what you're saying, but their mental pictures is unique to their experiences. It's like so, poetry. Yes. Uh, unlike television or cinema where yeah. you see what is there and you don't okay sometimes you get the symbolism more often than not most people don't but mm. you see it and it's there whereas with radio and with poetry you you're allowed to paint mental pictures in your mind and that's yeah. the beauty of radio that's beautiful thank you um Kenny, is there anything else? We, can you believe it? We are up to, we've been chatting for almost an hour. Is there anything else you'd like to add or to say to us as on Facebook and all our viewers? Um, anything else that you'd like to share with us? Look, I mean, you know, life can be tough, not just for so-called celebrities and personalities. I think for the average human being, it's probably tougher. Um, yeah. So, and then that reduces us or brings the, the, the playing field down to the fact that we're human and life happens. But it's how you deal with the challenges. I mean, when we went into lockdown, people were scared. By the way, I've never been afraid of COVID um, because I know my God is greater than COVID-19. And no weapon formed against me or my family shall prosper. And I rely heavily on Psalm 91 um, ah, yeah. so, and the blood of Jesus. So I'm not saying I'm irresponsible. I mean, I'm not going to go and expose my family or myself. Uh, to a dangerous situation where I can, you know, promote the spread of the virus. Uh, it's real. Yes, I'm not denying that. But I'm just saying I didn't allow fear to rule me. So even in the dark situation of, of yeah. lockdown and being isolated, I still had hope and, and, yeah. and, and relied on my savior. And that's gotten, gotten us through it. And, you know, we are on level one lockdown. There might be a second wave. Yes, maybe. I don't know. But let's not panic because when you look at the figures, 1% of the population hasn't passed away from COVID-19. We haven't even reached 1%. So let's not panic. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be responsible, but at the same time, let's be realistic. Let's be mature about this and let's not panic because there's no reason to panic. God yeah. is good all the time. <laughs> it's, so, it's so funny that you say that because yesterday the message was about you know, having uh, faith versus fear. And I actually did a, a little uh, video on Psalms 91 from the Passion Translation. So um, it is true. It is about, you know, either God is God or God isn't. And uh, either you depend on his word or you don't. Yeah, look, I've been through enough challenges in my life um, to know that God is good. I mean, you know, we had a revelation of Psalm 91. And 
few years after that, my daughter turned on her 15th birthday, or 16th birthday, actually. Uh, we were coming home from dinner from Monte Casino, and, you know, it was the, the atmosphere in the car was heavy, and I was almost falling asleep at the wheel, which, which yeah. is weird, because it was 9.30. I mean, I normally sleep at 1, 2 in the morning. Yeah. And uh, a BMW followed us, and we were driving an X5 at the time, and these guys basically stopped. I, I got into the driveway. I was lined up to go into the garage and Holy Spirit said to me, look at the gate. And as I looked to my right, I saw these headlights dip, which meant a car traveling at high speeds was breaking it, you know. Yeah. Um, and two guys popped out of the back carrying guns. And that part about, you know, no, no evil will come, uh, you know, yeah. on, on your dwelling place. Um, yeah. That part of, of Psalm 91 sprung to my mind immediately big and all i mean i hadn't read my bible that day i didn't pray at five in the morning i didn't do a 21 day fast all i did was call out the name of jesus and yeah the first guy couldn't enter the property the gate was wide open there was yeah. enough space for him to to come in he just stopped dead in his tracks the second guy tried to push him and he pushed back the guys in the car started reversing uh, i don't so in my in my understanding of things Either they saw the Lord or they saw angels of the Lord. Yeah. Um, and, and they got a skirk off their life and they jumped into the car and they drove off. I mean, there were four guys who could have done who knows what to my girls and to my wife mm -hmm. at the time or to me. Um, they could have cleaned us out. But all I did was call on the name of Jesus five times and five being the number for grace. Go figure. Go figure. Wonderful. Thank you, Kenny. It's been absolutely wonderful chatting to you. And getting to know you a little bit more and thank you so much for sowing your life and sowing a seed of hope in it would succeed so on behalf of richard richard maestri who you're not related to and myself probably am, probably am because the maestri <laughs> that came from video were one family yeah so on behalf of both of us we'd like to just say thank you so much we really appreciate you and to our facebook family and listeners i just want to say may god bless you may god make his face to shine upon you and please continue to be hopeful in this time. Bye-bye and God bless. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. <laughs>